there's many more reasons to, to stop versus start. Um, many more. And just like you said, we're all going to come up with every reason why we can't. Now we just need to change that a little bit and come up with all the reasons that we can. Boom. And we're live. Cindy Cohen, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Living the dream. Living the dream. And first of all, I love your office. Thank you. I love your team. It's just a really good vibe here. Thanks. Do you like living here? Love. So you're in in West Hollywood? I was, yeah, I was born in Florida. So I just dropped the F, came to LA and here I've been for 23 years. Wow. Yeah. Is this the dream spot, would you say? Or if I'm always curious because you've probably traveled all around the world. If there's one country that you could have just fell in love with what would it be i'm a greece fan so i you know i might be having to purchase something there soon does that go with greek food as well it goes with greek food greek people greek lifestyle i i really like greece greatest greek restaurant around here i'm a taverna tony's fan in malibu it's not really around here but it's pretty authentic (laughs) that's amazing yeah well, I'm really stoked. Just there's so m- your history is so amazing. I nice. mean, being a producer, I'm gonna be very honest. Don't know much about okay. it, so I'm very fired up to learn. And just your continuous grind to dip your toes into so many different things. It seems like your brain must be racing a million miles per hour. It does it doesn't? It's not good for sleep. But yes. <laughs> are Are you the type of person that just is constantly going? It's almost hard to stop yeah, the ideas. It is. I envy the people that can lay down in bed and you hear them snoring two minutes later. I'm the kind that's in bed and hours later, I'm just willing myself to shut down. Have you found a way to control the thoughts and to be able to maximize your productivity? I haven't, and I would love if anybody wants to chime in and tell me how. I have tried every meditation possible. I've done (laughs) sound baths, meditations, yoga, you name it. Um, I think those of us that kind of have that overactive brain I don't know. It's just something we have to live with. The tough um, thing, too, is the phone. Having the phone. phone right before. Yes. And we all do it. I'm so guilty. Right? <laughs> Gotta get We better. all do it. I know. Yeah. It's always interesting to see just our this whole new world. I mean, we're dealing with technology. We've never... Yeah. It's not normal to our brains. Right. And that extra dopamine hit every time we see a like, a comment, or just a new email comes in. It's hard to shut I've off the mind. I've gotten better of being off social media. Um, I... I'll do, you know, sorry, Instagram, but I'll do stories more than just They're so fun. posting. Um, I used to try to post, you know, one picture a day or one a week, and I can't do it anymore. I found that I just went down this vortex, like you're saying, of, you know, of all of a sudden there's likes and comments, and I'm the kind of person that wanted to answer everybody, which people have always been amazed. Yes, that is me. No, I don't have a team. Um, but hours would go by, and, you know, I need to be reading scripts or you know, looking for new projects or saving the world or doing a charity. So (laughs) I had to make a conscious decision that, um, uh, you know, I would only do that maybe once or twice a month now. Do you try to bucket things into specific time buckets? Has that helped you? I don't. I know that there's a lot of people that believe in, they write their lists and they check it off. I'm one of those people that has a memory that is unbelievable. I don't really write down anything and I remember everything. Um, so I don't. I'm also, and I don't know if this is a lot of people kind of like me, but I find myself very ADD. Right. So if I don't do it immediately, it won't get done. So I don't put it in time buckets because if I say I'm going to do it, it's going to be done that at that moment. Is the amazing memory a blessing or a curse? To people I date, it's probably a curse. <laughs> to everybody else, it's a memory. Right. Yeah, it's good. That's a great skill to yeah. have. In, in your profession with screenwriting and all that stuff, it must be invaluable. Yes, it is. How did this whole producer thing go down? Did you foresee yourself at no. 16 years old? You no, know, you're no. going to the prom. You're like, one day I'm going to be a producer. No, I, uh, so I have a very weird background. Um, I graduated with a degree in psychology and that's where I thought I was going to stay. Um, and, you know, it was amazing. And then I started working with abused and foster children, which I loved. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the courts rule that you have to give these kids back to their parents and you know it's going to happen again and so I found it really difficult to stay in that profession at least in the area that I was in um, just because I disagreed with some of the stuff that was happening and then um, 
I got a job with CBS News. I needed a night job. My boyfriend at the time was a singer in a band. And um, I needed a night job because his work was clearly at night. And news kind of got me into the producing world. And I, I knew I'm a news junkie. Um, you know, I'd love to cut the cable like some people are doing right now. And I'm, my fear is that, God forbid, I miss CNN, BBC, NBC, you name it. I've watched it. I'm probably a news um, encyclopedia at this point, and that's good and bad. Um, but my way around or my own escapism was telling stories that either could change the world or that were just fun and entertaining. And so slowly I got out of doing news. Um, I had a brief career as a songwriter, did actually really well. Oh, damn. Yeah, it was really strange. The first song I wrote ended up being Simon Cowell's first artist. So Simon Cowell and I came up Shout together. Shout out. Shout out to Simon Cowell and his artist, Sunita. Um, wrote two songs for her. Went That album went top 10 throughout Europe. Um, came back, wrote for a gentleman named Engelbert Humperdinck, my family, and all my, you know, I think most people's parents know Engelbert, but actually did great with him. And then wrote for a man named Howard Hewitt, who was part of a group called Shalimar with Jody Watley. And that song went to number three on the R&B charts. Um, and it was fabulous. I love music. I think I love music even more than film. Um, but there's many more talented people out there than me. I couldn't believe my songs were taken. So that's the, insane. Top I, ten. I know, and it. I had a. I'm a BMI songwriter. It's the whole thing was a surreal and amazing, but it felt like a hobby, and I was just speechless whenever somebody took something. So I switched over to film. Um, for all of you out there that don't know how you're going to do it, I started as a PA, like everybody else, climbed my way up, um, realized the company I was working for wasn't doing things quite the way that I would do them. So I took all my money from a songwriter and put it into a film company. And that company, years later, we had two Emmy nominations, a Golden Globe, a People's Choice. And I retired for the first time in my life on a film that had Oscars. Insane. It was insane. Boom. My, like, what? Yeah, yeah that was That's great. That's not typical. Yeah, it was, it was insane. I, I fall up. You so, you, so you make some cash doing the songwriting thing. First of all, that's so yeah. cool that you can do it that. It's amazing. So you're just thinking about music all the time. Or are you I just like music. tapping I your foot, like jamming? Love it. Classic rock's my jam. I love it. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And you take this, you're having an early career. You're having immediate success. I mean, just having a song hit that, that's right. pretty nuts. And then you go and just go all in on it. being a producer? I don't recommend it to people. I've always lived my life, I guess, kind of as a gambler, but I gamble on me. You know, and I tell people it's like playing red or black at a roulette table at midnight when you kind of want to go to bed, but you kind of have $100 left and you kind of want to see if you can just do it one more time. I always knew, and that's how I went into film, it's not the smartest way to go into something, but I took everything I had, put it into that company and always knew I'd go back to psychology or something if it didn't work. Um, but I bet on me and it worked. Did you know starting this company did you have experience producing movies or did you just say so, let's give it a shot no no so I, I worked for another company for a period of time I was in acquisitions which means that I would go and I would find movies that were typically going to Sundance or the festivals and I would be okay. the person to say whether we would buy them and then they um, put me on a film there are people known as executives or executives in charge of production I don't know why they picked me I shouldn't have been there um, I got thrown on a film in Canada. I was way too young, had no experience what was didn't the know film? what I was doing. God, what was it called? Um, I don't even remember. I remember Danny Aiello, um, Elias Koteas. There was some all kinds of actors that were in it. Um, I don't know why they did it to me, but that was my first film. And I was the one that was in charge. And Of the whole thing. It kind of gave me the bug. Um, it was Learning 101. Again, I don't know if I recommend it to people. Um, those of you in AFI film school, kudos to you. I think it's incredible. But um, I learned the scrappy way of, you know, you just had to do it. Do you think that that's the play? You, because, you know, there's a lot of debates now with people going to school, whether it be film school or whether it be college. Right. A lot of the times, and I definitely share the opinion that you got to go out there in the field and learn. Right. Getting that one-on-one -on -one mentorship is yeah. huge. I couldn't say which is better. And, um, you know, a lot of people go to AFI or these other film schools and that are all around the country and it's amazing what they learn in fact these kids are learning a lot more than I ever knew and they know how to do a lot more than I know I even look at some of the stuff they do going back to Instagram and I'm like how the heck did they do that <laughs> you know um, 
but to me, I like to experience. I, I want to get my hands dirty, and I think, you know, the way that my brain works, I want to just do. Um, I'm that way even when you get something. You know, there are people that read the directions, and there are people that try to figure it out, right. and the one that tries to figure it out. That's great. So you assemble your own furniture? You're that type I, you of You know, person? I'm not that great, but I, I'll give it my best you shot. You take that yes, task? I do. That's awesome. Yeah. I feel like film running it must be such chaos on a film set there must be so much going on and for me it, I, I feel like it's almost sort of like running a mini company when you're on a it set is. what is that experience like because i'm curious about this as well with your degree in psychology do you feel that that has kind of played to a huge role in you being able to work with all sorts of different personalities because i'm assuming you hear crazy ones in hollywood yeah, um, psychology has definitely helped. Um, and it's, I, you know, some people used to call me the set whisperer because some talents can be very difficult. And um, I do think it helps me to calm down sets. I'm known to be very good at that. Um, I think the psychology has made me incredibly diplomatic in my dealings with people. And back to your other thing, every time you start a movie, it is starting a mini company down to the LLC that has to be formed to the crew that is hired specifically on every movie. There's hundreds of them. And then for the next anywhere from four weeks to three to six months, that becomes your family as far as um, the actual photography, physical photography being done, meaning there's a DP and the actors are there. Uh, most people don't realize our job doesn't end there, unfortunately, when the actors and that crew disappears, then comes my next crew, which are the post-production crew. And um, that's where a lot of people fall apart in film because they hate it and they don't understand that that film is so far from over. Now we're going to sit in an editing room probably for another six months and we're going to lay over the sound and the music and we're going to look at the same scene 45 times to see if we can get the right you know, expression on that actor's face or the right sound or maybe he didn't sit right the first one or maybe it wasn't didn't match up you know to the second one so the post people are incredible and um hats off to anybody who's an editor i don't know how they do it when you get this script so you read the script you're basically the first eyes on it and then you must decide what's this going to cost to produce even if you want to do it so i'm, I'm assuming first you have to pitch it to whoever is going to be potentially funding it are you also that person on the front lines pitching? Yeah. So we find um, a script. Typically, I, my company sticks to specific genres. Um, so we find something that works in the genres that I personally resonate to. Um, if you're lucky enough to know talent or a director, then the next thing you do is try to attach that talent or director to it. Um, and then you do the typical rounds. Um, we're doing two movies with Sony, so Sony becomes one of the first companies that we would go to. But um, I want to do something with Netflix. I want to do something with Amazon. Streaming is nothing to be embarrassed about in the wave of the future. I'm not even sure how many people eventually are going to go to film, you know, meaning a theater, versus sitting at home and watching it on your couch. And that's a big debate to see what's happening in this business. Is Netflix coming up as one of the titans in the film space? Because I know a few years ago, and again, I'm very naive on this subject, but there was a bunch of jokes about Netflix taking anything they can get at the time. Netflix is probably the biggest at this point. Um, they spend a lot. Their quality is a lot. They're raising the bar now. Now they want to start doing 25 million and up movies. What's going to be interesting is to see what happens to Netflix now that Disney's coming. Um, everybody's looking at Disney to kind of squash everybody. Uh, and I'm not sure. I mean, Disney's the biggest at this point, but I think there's room for Netflix and Amazon and Hulu. What I'm going to be amazed at is to see how many others can come. Like now we've got CBS Prime and, you know, um, Facebook and Apple. And what I'm curious to see is how many of them can survive in this. Like, you know, even if we all end up cutting our cable, how many of these can we get? Uh, you know, my bandwidth probably is for three, not, <laughs> you know, not seven or eight. Right. Starting, so it's IEG is the company you started. IEG was the first company, yeah. And it, your first company was a home yeah, run. It was a home run. It was crazy. What's the day like when you're sitting there signing the papers with your co-founder? Like, let's do this. You know, we were so naive. Um, 
my partner at the time, um, Graham King, who just produced Bohemian Rhapsody, so yay, Graham. Um, you know, we were naive. He worked for the same company I did. He knew that I had a lot of talent relationships, and I also had the money. And we both were doing two different things. He was doing sales. I was doing acquisitions and productions. And I don't even think we were nervous. We were just, we just kind of did what I said originally. It was kind of black or red. Um, we just went for it. It was not glamorous. We didn't have this well thought out business plan. We kind of went to um, American Film Market, which is a market that comes once a year in Santa Monica. We got a little office. Um, I went and found one film. Um, we took it to the market and announced our company, thinking nobody would not even notice us. The film was a Leslie Nielsen film way back when. It was a family film. And we ended up selling more at that festival than any other company. And at the time, there were these magazines like Moving Pictures magazine, and there were the festival magazines. And they ended up putting us on the cover saying, I.E.G. Who?, which was shocking. And the reason being, nobody knew where we came from and we had just sold more than anybody and that started the company. Damn. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. That's a wake up incredible. moment. It was great. How does that even feel when you do that? Do you just get a rough of endorphins or are you like, wow, let's go bigger and bigger now? Yeah, I think, you know, it was so long ago that you just, I don't, I, I wish, you know, you always hear those sayings, I wish I knew now. I, I wish I knew then what I know now. I think we, it just came so easy for us. I mean, I think there's things that happen when you're younger that you don't even realize. I mean, do we feel good? We felt amazing about it. Did we know to feel even more amazing? No, we're, we were so naive. It's amazing what you do when you're younger, things that you wouldn't do now because now you think it out too much. Right. Um, if there's anything I would say to my older self is don't think so much, just do it. Taking a bet on a film, it seems like the same concept of taking a bet on a startup. You know, you put X amount of dollars in, you receive X amount of capital. Yeah. There's a lot of them to invest in. Yeah. Everyone's dying to have someone like you see their script and bring it into life. What's the secret sauce to f picking out a good script? I, so I study the markets and I stick to genres that I, that I know and I like. Um, I think a lot of people get hung up on doing their passion projects and for me, that doesn't work. That's something that you go to your uncle or your aunt, and you get them to finance your movie on a credit card. And by the way, some of those movies go on and get Oscars, and some of those pop through at Sundance, but a lot of those never get seen. Um, uh, we personally don't do those. I don't want things that are overly depressing. I don't want um, terminally ill movies. Um, what I will do, because I do a lot of charities, are movies that resonate biopics that you know that can go and get me an Oscar one day but I'll read them thinking what actor could I get and how does this you know kind of come in front of the fray of other movies um, and that's just a personal choice you know the other things that like you know if you look at the market right now and you're at a movie theater what's mostly being shown for some reason right now people love horror movies um, and so do I so you recently produced one we're, we've got one starting in about five weeks. So um, I love horror. Saying that, I'll never do slasher. You will you won't see me doing Freddy or Jason or any <laughs> of those. Doesn't mean that they're not good. It just means that's not what we'll do. So the horror that I'll do is much more grounded in reality, um, meaning I like horror that is based on court documents or books or articles, um, things that really scare you. Um, like the real world stuff real that could be stuff. happening next door. Yes. The creeper that's I love mingling. love that stuff. Love, love, love that stuff. So, you know, that's our first movie going at Sony under um, a deal that we've got. And we'll look for a lot more like those. And, you know, I go back to when I was a kid. The scariest movie I ever saw was The Exorcist. Oh. Never played with a Ouija board again. Oh, man. Don't know. I'd have to watch that movie and see if it holds up still. But um, I want those movies that, you know, that leave a mark on people. Um, yeah, that you just go, oh my God, that was terrifying. Do you ever think about yourself when you think in your own head, like, how did I just think about that? That's, that's mortifying. Yeah, it's, it's, it's mortifying. I think the scariest thing of the movie we're about to do now is it's based on a true story and Sony was making motions and I, I don't know how we're going to handle this of possibly shooting in the real house. And that, 
you know, this particular house was one of the first haunted houses ever. It was the first televised exorcism ever on TV, ever, in the 70s. ABC televised it. And what happened to the family that was left behind? Do I want to shoot in that house? No. I'll, like, you know, I'll be taking every protective gear possible, as you see in my office, and you guys can't see, but I've got all kinds of protection things. Whether I believe in them or not, I'm not sure, but they're all over the place, from mezuzahs to ganesh to... Um, crystals, you name Very it. Very good vibes. Yeah, man. right. You name it. I'm just going to, who knows what works. So, um, yeah, it's all here. Even that's like a protection tree that's sitting in front of you. This that's thing. a protection that's tree. That's a protection tree. People start sending me this stuff and I'm, you know, I'm a believer enough to not believe. Sky, we got to get ourselves a protection tree. Right? I don't know what it does, but it's sitting there, you know. It looks fantastic. <laughs> right? Right. That's crazy. Yeah. Ha- is Halloween was your favorite? Love Halloween. I feel like if there was Halloween 10... 10- 12 times a year people would be happier love halloween people need to dress up more they and be ridiculous right it's makes you feel night, so yeah, alive just halloween and thanksgiving those are my holidays one thing circling it back is okay. you were an equestrian it was so you're big into the horse game i am to this day do you still love it i do love it i wish i rode more um so the little known fact about me is i was the youngest world champion ever um in american saddlebreds i think i got my first world championship at nine um <laughs> Yeah, it was insane, and I think the last time that I got it, there's a picture somewhere of Joe Namath presenting um, the trophy to me at, I can't remember if we were in New York or Kentucky. Um, It was an amazing time of my life. Um, It probably gave me the competitive edge that I've got to this day. My father and mother were very smart, though. Nobody could beat me, and so my parents decided that it was time to stop, that you could only go down and it started getting really cutthroat, even way back when. I, think. I mean, you're nine. I was nine. I think I stopped when I was like 14. Um, but somebody had like thrown acid in one of my horse's faces. I mean, it got that dark because you couldn't be beat. It's all these kind of crazy things like you see in these movies. And um, my father was smart enough to say, we're done. Like, you know, um, we're out. But it's you know, it's a part of my life that feels like someone else's life. And it was amazing. My mom had a Pasofino horse yeah, growing up. They're beautiful. And they're known for that smooth ride. Yeah. Incredible. Was, they're amazing. I, I rode them up five, ten times. It was fun. Though. Oh, they're amazing. My father still has some racehorses, although I think he's cutting back on those. But we actually won um, the Breeders' Cup. And that was amazing. Are you about that ranch life? I would do that in a second. If I, if and when I leave LA, and I'm not sure I'm leaving anytime soon, but that's the life I want. I could see you with the full farm, yeah. oh, totally. making your own wine. I love the, all animals. the animals. Yeah, you look like absolutely. you love animals. I do. So that's that's a dream of mine. One day, when I'm done with this, there'll definitely be property and horses and dogs and all that. It's really interesting that animals, just people that like animals, mm-hmm. there's a very high chance that there are going to be good people. Yeah. If you don't right? like animals, what's going on with you? Right. Where you sleep, you should be in one of these films she's making. Yeah. You're going to be doing some crazy stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> it's it's very interesting. Yeah. So when you did, when you went through with IEG, I think you produced, what, tw- 20 plus we movies? We bought Financer produced 25 movies in five years. It was insane. So you, your desk, is it just stacked? Yeah, it was bad. Um, I don't recommend people to do that. Uh, again, shows how driven um, I was or we were at the time. But it was, I didn't take a vacation for five years. It was, if I wasn't on a film set, I was in an editing room. If I was in an editing room, I was in a bank closing. Um, was hell on my partner at the time. It was, you know, it's not, it's, you know, I succeeded in what I wanted to succeed in. And there was some cost to it, but um, but I wouldn't trade it for anything being a co-founder in any company mm-hmm. it's really like a marriage to that person you go yes. through a lot especially when you're legally bound yep so that must have been an interesting growing experience between you two going through all these crazy ups and downs because you have say maybe a 25 million dollar budget yep. and all of a sudden you're five million dollars over is the stress just start to boil we were pretty lucky um i don't really think we went over in any of our films spoken wow. from a good producer Dang. um I actually don't know if any of my films have ever done that. I mean, we had some challenging times with a very A-list director, whose name I probably won't mention, um, but in probably one of the top five A-list directors. And he was challenging because he didn't want to lock the film. And that made our budgets go over and over because until the director locks, you can't pay anybody back. And and that was challenging. Um, We also shot 
that particular film in a country in the middle of a war. Um, so we were shooting in Serbia at the time that the Milosevic government uprose, and that was challenging. Um, and that was all contributing to me retiring at some point. We were shooting in a country in the middle of a war, and then I would come back to Dallas, Texas, um, and we had a director who's near and dear to my heart named Robert Altman, but he had just found out he was very sick, and so we had to deal with that. And then at the same time, we were starting to shoot a movie called Very Bad Things that is still to this day one of my favorite movies, but that was challenging because Christian Slater had just gotten arrested on the first day of our shoot. So there's all these things in the film <laughs> you just business get all that, these wild you, cards. Yeah, that you never know, like a war and a sickness and prison um, at the beginning of movies. And so you just never know, but it's... Um, you can't make this stuff can't up. can't make this stuff up. But it makes it fun and exciting. And some people say, who would you be if you could be anybody in your life? And I'd be me. Oof. Yeah. Let's get some mirrors out here. Let's get mirrors out there. It's all I'd be. I can't imagine anybody's life being better than mine. So when you sold, though, when you sold, you're like, all right, I'm done with it. I'm You p- potentially burned yourself out. You went so all in. And maybe you didn't just burn it. You want to do something new. Do you ever feel like you hit a point in your life where you truly sort of hit rock bottom? Because I feel like with a lot of people that have been through such diverse experiences with you, it's those people that have been through some of the worst pain that end up creating the biggest successes because they can resonate with so many people. I don't know if rock bottom is the word I'd use. When I retired, it was to retire, though. I was done with film. And I was done with film more because um, I was raised very Southern. And as a Southern girl, you get married. And you get married early. And you're the girl behind the guy. And it's just a Southern mentality that my whole family has followed. I didn't. Um, And I had a very tough time grappling with myself what I did and at the time of IEG I was engaged to be married and it broke up because he was second to everything else and we should have broken up Um, but when I retired it was to not come back and film again and I was one of the first female distributors ever in this business and um, I'd made my mark I'd done what I needed to do the the unfortunate thing for me was um, I decided I was going to be the girl behind a guy. And so for the next six years, I didn't work at all. And um, I did a lot of lunches. I did a lot of party circuits. I went on a lot of trips. Um, but I tried to dumb down because I didn't want people to know that I'd gone to an Ivy League school or I, I had bought and sold a company. Interesting. Um, you didn't want people to I know that. I didn't want people to know that. Um, Is it because how people treated you? You know, again, it's it's a Southern thing. So um, a lot of Southern people believe that men want girls that are needy, that are needy, um, or that are that need them in certain ways. And to a, to a large extent, that's true. It can be very intimidating to to have somebody who is as independent as I am. So um, I wanted to fulfill the wishes, probably of my mom, of now it's time for you to be the girl behind the guy. The problem was um, I would find guys that might not have had the drive that I did, and then I would try to push them to be me, and that wasn't fair either. So I wasn't being fair to them. I wasn't being fair to myself. It, I think in both ways it was very inauthentic. Um, and then one day I just realized, what am I doing? I'm, I'm, not, I'm living somebody else's dream, not my dream. And then I opened these doors and came back. Seems like that's probably the one biggest factor in successful marriages and relationships is drive. Yeah. Because those initial feelings are gonna go away. But if you can't have those that we gonna get it, like yeah. moving to the next making moves, which is basically yeah. you, that must have been tough. You must have been through some not dark times, but that must yeah, have been confusing. I think, I think with anybody, whether it's relationships or just life, is a lot of people and I said this on somebody's um show the other day is People don't live authentically to themselves. We're so busy trying to please a parent, a spouse, a child, um, even a boss, that we're we're trying to fill their wishes, not our own. And so a lot of people just kind of go to bed every night, get up every morning, and they start the same day again. And their life becomes kind of something that's not meaningful. Um, For me, even with the charities that I pick to get behind or anything that I do, it's got to have meaning. 
you know, I'm not somebody who's going to raise money for charity to sit at a table with somebody that I can say, oh, I sat at a table with so-and-so. That doesn't any do anything for me. Um, if I'm doing a charity, I want to know where the money goes. And I want to get my hands wet. I want to see what's happening. If, if it's, you know, a charity, let's say like Project Angel Food, which is something in L.A., then go to the kitchen, make the meal, pass out the food, you know. Um, I was the West Coast chair of a charity called Little Kids Rock, and I was constantly going to the schools. Not only that, I would have the kids up to my house. Um, you have to. What I don't know what it means to just write a check and not know where it goes. Right. They talk about that in the Bill Gates Foundation, how hard it is to give away money. Yeah. It's an entire task in itself to make yeah. sure it's going to the right place. And you have to make sure that the money really does get given away. That's the other thing. It's sad that so many people at the goodness of their heart, were really ready to check and then find out later, just paid some salaries. When you're chasing meaning, right? Because you've been through the ups of selling a business. You've created countless films. I mean, you've had a ton of highs. Your endorphins must be pumping just throughout your whole history. What gives you that same, like, oh my God moment, that speechless moment that just your heart's fluttering and you're so stoked on life? I mean, just in life in general or whatever? Um, I'm a traveler and I, every time I travel, I've got that, oh my God moment. <clears throat> I just got back um, from Africa earlier this year and much as you think you've seen everything, you go to something like Africa and you go on a safari and you're surrounded by elephants. There's, that was the oh my God moment that I think just changed me. Like you just, as much as you think you've done or seen, you're just reduced to one little thing amongst this grand these grand species that don't even look like they're they belong they, they shouldn't even be walking on this planet and yet they are so and it so i have to say it changed me on a cellular level i came back i got off meat um i can't wait to go back i want to save the elephants now um, you know it's just it was amazing we there's a, a a girl on our podcast that came on a few times lisa kitasaho and at 20 years old she went to south africa through a college course to work with a cheetah foundation or something she did it for a week or two she got the bug made the effort sent out a ton of emails somehow got an opportunity to move out to south africa next thing you know she's the head of the western cape cheetah conservation and now she raises and rehabilitates cheetahs it's she's 27 years old every day when i look at her instagram story i'm like damn you know she's out there in the felt with these animals raising being on the front lines, I just feel like... I think at some point in my life, I'll be doing something like that. People are shocked, and I've been making motions, and some people laugh, and then other people know, no, I'm serious. I don't know if the rest of my life will be in America, um, because I think there's another life that's ahead of me. Um, I'm not leaving anytime soon. I've still got a bunch of films to do. I'm still here, but... Um, there's another, you know, every time you travel, just got back from Israel too. I try every year to go to two countries. And um, every time you travel, it just broadens you in such a way. And you realize that we get so caught up in ourselves or living in the areas that we live in, no matter what area you live in, New York, Miami, LA, wherever it is. But once you start traveling, you just realize there's a whole world out there and it's so different. And we can all, no matter how book smart you think you are, you're not smart at all until you go out there and live it um, and you experience it. And then there's um, two types of travel, right? There's the resort travel where you're going on the five-star resort and you're like, are you really traveling? I don't know. And then there's the in the trenches going to the local pub, getting to know with the locals. And you realize people are good. People are inherently really good. Right. They are. And by the way, I travel both ways. <laughs> so um, I believe in the resorts because why not if you of can? Of course, hell yeah. But every place that I go, I'll try to make sure I'm there with the locals. And if I'm with the locals, I also try to do something good. So before we went to Africa, we tried to figure out what did they need? What do those kids need? Are we bringing underwear? Are we bringing jeans? Are we bringing, what are we bringing? And, um, you know, I was laughing last night talking to somebody because a lot of times I'm with actors and I'm like, no cell phones, no selfies. Those are the moments that we don't need to capture them all on social media. Let's do it from the goodness of our heart. It's fine to do the social media posts, but but why? We don't need. Life doesn't need to all be captured. It's so true because we forget we're not living in the present. Yeah, That's no, you need to experience it, not worry about 
do I look good? And is the moment right? That is a multi-billion dollar opportunity out there for whoever can create something. And I know there's meditation apps and there's some yep. things, but whoever can bring us back 30 years. Because it's true. If I'm not with my phone for six hours, like part of me is like, what's up? Yeah. What's up? Yeah. Where's my email? Right. Did Cindy's assistant text me? Yeah. Like, what's good? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're just kind of like always on. So shutting that down and just going back to earth which is tough because we're, you know, we're floating on a giant rock in the middle of time and space. So we don't know what's good. And then we get caught up. I get so upset at myself when I get caught up in just any type of drama, whether it be work drama, my, my life, anything. Cause it's like, it doesn't matter. It's yeah. not even real. Right. You know, those moments when you're just feeling yourself, you're vibing when you're with good friends. I think being with good people is the greatest feeling. A hundred percent. I'm really big into my, uh, I do monthly dinners. You so too. I'll invite and I'll, yeah. I'll cook for Tell like... Tell me, I want to come. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I would love it. Yeah. Oh, I cook for like, you know, 25, 30 people and Amazing. everyone comes over, bring a friend. Isn't that and great? that's sometimes the best time you get to meet people. I do that Thanksgiving. I, my family is all in Florida and I realized that years ago that a lot of people had no place to go for Thanksgiving. Everybody on Thanksgiving goes to their girlfriend's house, their boyfriend's house, their spouse's house or their family, or they're running to get out of here. And there's a whole group of people that have absolutely nowhere to go. And I'm so thankful during Thanksgiving. My Thanksgiving became too big recently. I've got to somehow now figure out how to pare it down. But the past couple of years have been about 150 people. Wow. And um, you have to come alone. If you've got people in your life, then you don't need to be there. This is for the people that are alone. And it's turned into something super special. It's getting, like I said, too big for me because it's just me doing the whole thing. No, no one's sponsoring it or catering. It's me. Um, we've gotten it now where everybody tries to bring a dish or something. A potluck. And, and, um, but typically, I think last year I got seven turkeys and seven hams. And But you're surprised how many people were alone that day that would say to me, no one's ever invited me anywhere. And it made me feel super thankful to be able to do it and it's uh, you know those are the moments that we live for give yeah, back so much right it's just makes something special um i've started doing it at labor day too or memorial day not labor day memorial day most people don't even know what memorial day is um i've chosen to make memorial day a memory where i invite people over and we actually burn something that you no longer want in your life from the year before so i've made it a very special day um, people come over. Yes, I have a shaman in there, and I've become very L.A. in that respect. But you just burn anything you no longer want. It could be something like a person where you're not hurting them. You're burning their energy away from you. Or your life can be absolutely great, in which case you can burn the word fear or obstacles. Um, does it do anything? I don't know. But it makes that day, again, really special. And with everybody there collectively talking about just freeing something they no longer want in their lives – those are the moments that are great. So you doing a dinner for 25 people, that's the kind of people I like to be around, and those are the kind of things that I like to do. It's amazing, too, it's amazing, when you right? see the big smiles on people's right? faces when you're not looking from anything for them. Right. You're just like, what it's up? Great. Let's have a good time. And I love introducing people to people. It's just Isn't like, that the best the when your good friends become friends with your right? other friends? I don't understand the people that want to say this, like, keep them quiet. I want everybody to meet and have fun. You know, go work together, go meet each other, go. It's great. That's the second mission of this entire podcast is connect the favorite people I've met in my life with each other and see them do great things. Because it seems like being around good people is everything. When I'm surrounded by badasses that are making moves, that are happy, that are feeling good, I'm doing those same things. When I'm in a slumber and i am been with a bunch of people that party their faces off, I'm probably doing the same thing. But it's like getting around those people is probably the number one key that I see. And, and clearly you did a very good job at it at a young age. And I would tell people, and I know this sounds strange, you will go through times in your life where you clean out. Just like you're going to clean out the closet. You're going to go through times in your life where you just have to sit back, look at somebody and go, it doesn't mean we're not friends anymore, but you might no longer serve me. And you'll realize if you do that, that there's some people that actually are keeping you back or down. And again, you'll be surprised when you make room for somebody else to come in, how uplifting it becomes. Because you're right, there are those cheerleaders that are going to want to cheer you on. And no matter what you do, they're going to be rooting in your corner. And then there's some people that, you know, they're not malicious, but they might not want you to be do as good. Because in you doing good, you might leave them behind. 
you know, or you finding a significant other means they can't be your plus one or, you know, for whatever reasons. Kind of pulling you down. You're not right. climbing and out. Right. And sometimes you're not even that conscious of it or aware of it. So I always tell people, take a step back, take a look around you and yeah, surround yourself with cheerleaders. It's interesting because the Marie, I think it's the Marie Kondo. I might get her name right. Yeah. So she's got the whole deal where you take everything in your room, you put it into the center of the room, you look at it and say, do I love this? And if you don't love it, get rid of it. I don't know if I could do that, but yes, she does that and I probably need her because there's so much in my house. Although she would have thrown out probably everything I'm wearing right now. (laughs) (laughs) It's interesting just the way of, of getting and optimizing our lives to be better because that's what keeps us young. That's what keeps us thriving. That's what keeps people moving. And if you're not learning a new hobby, you're not growing. You're not getting out of that. For you, you've conquered this film scene up and down. You went into a whole separate life. You realize it wasn't you. You're in this kind of trap almost that society put you in. But then you came back out. So you decided to come back into it. And now you have Cindy Cohen Entertainment. Yeah, it's Cindy Cohen. And and yeah, it's, it's great and passionate. Again, sometimes you also need to step back to realize how much you loved what you had all the, you know, the whole time. For sure. So it's... It's great. Yeah. So when you came back into the industry, Mm -hmm. what was your first big comeback? What was your comeback film? So I found um, a thriller and um, didn't know if actors still wanted to work with me the way that they used to. Um, One always hopes, but I was gone for years. Um, I found a thriller, decided we were going to Barcelona to shoot it. Never been to Barcelona before and got incredibly lucky that teeny little actors like Robert De Niro and Sigourney Weaver and Killian Murphy and Elizabeth Olsen and Toby Jones all said, well, come with you. Wow. And it was amazing. And so that was my comeback film. We were the opening night at Sundance. We were one of the biggest sales at Sundance that year. And it was a great way to come back. Damn. It was great. What's it like working with these giant actors and actresses? Is it a process in itself? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, some actors are very quirky and it becomes a process in itself. Some actors like to stay in character the whole time. Some actors don't want to socialize with anybody. And, you know, Robert De Niro is amazing. He's got his own process um, where everybody hangs out in an area called Video Village, usually, which is where all the, the director, which is where your director is looking at all the playbacks. And a lot of actors want to sit there. And that's where the makeup artists typically are and, and the producers. Um, there are actors like Bob De Niro who wants to stay off by himself and not break character. Um, sometimes those are intimidating at the beginning, and other times it's fascinating to watch them. Just absolutely fascinating. So for the most part, um, I love watching actors and act. Just and on and off. On and off. So you love people. I love people. I'm definitely a people person. Are there certain, is there any actors that specifically kind of blew your mind? in terms of just who they are? One of the most quirky people you've ever met in your life? Quirky. I don't know if I... How about weird? I won't say that. I definitely have some weird ones I'd love to out right now in this program. There's some I won't work with again. There's some that are weird. <laughs> um, I, that's a whole nother thing, but we'd have to be off camera for that. But, but you know, fun and amazing. I remember working with Cameron Diaz and just thinking she was just a light. I mean, I loved Cammie's as down to earth as you get, and I just adored her. And she's like the friend you grew up with type person. She's amazing. She's the girl next door. And um, an actor I've never worked with, but I want to, is Liam Neeson. Liam became one of my best friends and kind of mentors through the years when I was very young. We've never worked together. We both were up for Oscars at the same time him, Kinsey, me, Traffic. Neither of us got Best Picture. I'm saving that day when we can both work together but on something that I really think is an Oscar and um, sitting with someone like him and just listening to him talk about the business is fascinating you know it's just fascinating and on the flip side I did a movie with Oliver Stone I mean Oliver Stone I grew up you know on his movies and just sitting with Oliver and hearing his stories I typically like some of these older actors that you just kind of hang on every word and has much as you think you've done, you listen to them and you're like, oh my God. Uh, an actress I've never worked with that I really want to is Helen Mirren. I, I've i spoken to her a couple of times. I've never found the right vehicle for either one of us, but how amazing is she? I mean, she's one of my idols. I just think she's incredible. 
I think a lot of people struggle with the believing in themselves part. It seems to come very naturally to you. You know, you, you know, you step, you just, you step in and the energy changes. And I think a lot of people are right now are holding themselves back from making a big move in their life. Maybe they're scared. Fear. Fear stops us all. Fear stops do, everybody. It really does. Do you, do you think that there's anything you would say to that person that's right on the edge of stepping onto their dream, whether that be starting a business, whether that be going to acting school, whether that be quitting everything and starting a film, whatever it is, what would you say to that person that's right on the fence? You know, and I've had to say it to myself, just do it. Nike's got the greatest um, slogan, of, slogan all time. of all time and just do it. it. You never know until you try. And most of us won't try because if we do try and we fail, we failed. And to me, what if you succeed? You know, what if you succeed? And if you just do it, just take a baby step, just do it. Um, I think that's, we all hold ourselves back with that. I keep saying I'm gonna write a book one day. Actually, I have three books I wanna write and I've toyed with starting a beauty company too. And you know, I'm making up my own excuses and yet they're kind of not, but I'm so busy because we're, this little company is so many films set up now. Now we're going into TV as well that it's like, how do I do it? How do I find more time? I'm not sure I can do this, but I will and I can. And, you know, whether it's over Christmas I start or something else, you just have to do it. And so, you know, I'm going to say the same thing that I'm going to say to all the listeners or viewers out there. Just do it. I saw this quote the other day. It was like, I forgot exactly what it said. It's on my Instagram story. But it would be the, the worst day in your life is when you come face to face with the person that you could have been. Yeah, 100 percent. There was a slogan I read a long time ago, and it's I actually have an Abraham Lincoln um, painting in the in the foyer, which I'll show you when you leave. And it shows how for about 30 years, Abraham Lincoln was a loser. He the man failed at every single thing he did in his life until he became president. And under that painting is a, is a slogan saying, um, a winner never quits and a quitter never wins. And so when you think about that, that says it all. I mean, you know, you can't, you know, if you're going to quit, you're never going to win. And to be a winner, you can't quit. And that's, you know, that's it. You just have to keep pushing forward and believing in yourself. Eventually you'll find your tribe. Of course you will. hundred percent. And everybody's good at something. Sometimes we just don't realize what we're good at. And sometimes it's just sitting back and going, God, I'm so passionate about animals. Why don't I volunteer to help a humane society or a pound right now? And wait, maybe that takes me into, I'm better at this, like your, like your friend with the chimps than you thought you were. And all of a sudden you find your passion that you never believed, you know, or, or we've got these conceptions. Well, I didn't go to school for that. Well, you might not need to. Most people don't need to. We're... I'm going to take on a director that I saw the other day and she did a sizzle reel that blew me away and I went and met her she did a sizzle reel to get her film funded and she did a short she put up four thousand dollars and did a short it was unbelievable she'd never gone to film school she had moved to Tampa to follow her boyfriend when she was there she was bored she started reading books upon books about how to make a film put it back to her own self with couple grand turned it into a short took the short, wrote a screenplay, turned that into a sizzle reel, and now her movie's being shot in five weeks from now. And she's somebody that, you know, she did it. She did it. She and did it, she did it in a way where I've seen so many shorts and sizzles. They didn't stand out to me. This girl came out of nowhere, read a book, and did it. And it's like, you know, I want these kids mentoring me. A lot of times they come in and they're like, you know, well, I mentor them. They're so much smarter than my generation. I have to say, they just, they are, I'm like, yeah, I'll mentor you, but you might want to mentor me. I have no idea how you did that. You're, None. You're always learning. You always. got that mentor e mentor. Always We learning. can learn something from everyone. Always learning. These kids, like I said, are so much smarter than my generation. I didn't have, you know, Google at my disposal when I was growing up. We had an encyclopedia. I mean, if I wasn't flipping those pages and looking, we didn't, we didn't have that. It's amazing what you can learn now. If you have a hint of ambition, you're set in today's set. world. Absolutely set. Absolutely. And you can do and be and work whatever you want. You could be the weirdest person on the planet. Weirdest person on the planet. Like and you'll get your own tribe of weird. Recently, I saw this this Instagram that do documents very close-up pictures of bugs. 
very like like right. a bugs out, like a beetle like at yeah, yeah. the maximum frame and you're looking at this thing it's straight out of a horror right. movie right i'm like you're telling yeah, yeah. me mother earth has been yeah. having these things this whole time and we've never seen that right you should look at some of those pictures you'll get some crazy I think I've ideas seen some of those we had somebody come in here one day with bugs because they wanted us to eat them to see if there was a show coming and i got to say they lost me on the worms and you know but they're nutritious and they're great and maybe the world's heading that way but um that was also weird. I mean, they bought in moss and cockroaches and wanting everybody to try them. And I was like, mm, yeah, you lost me. Yeah. I think I tried a, I think I tried a worm and a grasshopper and I was done. Damn. <laughs> no. Well played. Yeah, well played. Fear factor is back. Right? It's back. Just, yeah. Don't I, want anything alive. People need to throw more Hail Marys. Yes. I think that's one of the biggest things. You need to throw more Hail Marys. It's like, you just never know. You never know who you can connect with. You never know the opportunities that can show. And things happen when you're in motion. Yeah. You know, kinetic versus passive or kinetic versus active. Like, we're just full of potential energy and we're not making moves on it. Yeah. There's a bajillion reasons to quit. Being sick, going through a divorce, life's tough, you're broke. Yeah. As long as you're alive and you can think you got something. Yeah, I agree. There's many more reasons to, to stop versus start um many more and just like you said we're all going to come up with every reason why we can't um now we just need to change that a little bit and come up with all the reasons that we can poof i love that right we got to copyright that right there that's got to be the trailer <laughs> but so t you're deep in film you've produced yes. over probably 30 or 40 films mm -hmm. in your life and now you're getting into tv yes how do they compare it's so different um I'm really excited about TV. I think TV is better than it's ever been. I'm one of those people that, like everybody else, it's like, God, do we go to the theater? I don't know, this is on. And there's so many amazing shows to watch that um, it's overwhelming. I, you know, you can ask people what their favorite shows are, you're gonna write them all down and, you know, we're all losing ourselves because all of a sudden you find yourself binge watching and whoever did that before where it's like, no, I can't talk to you. I've got, you know, 24 hours to finish like every episode of, whatever um i'm super excited to get into tv our first foray into it is um something near and dear to my heart again i try to do true stuff if i can and um handmaid's tale is one of my favorite shows um to that end we're doing um a series based on ellis island and ellis island deals with immigration immigration is on everybody's minds these minds days. these days so disheartening to watch what's happening. Um, in my case, my grandparents came through Ellis Island. Ellis Island is right outside New York City. It didn't happen that long ago. It can happen again. And it's no different than what's starting to happen now. I mean, we need to be very cognizant that history is about to repeat itself. And if there's any opportunity to help stop it or slow it down, we need to. It's very interesting that you're taking your passions and putting it into a something you're passionate about yeah. that's actually making an actionable impact in the yes. world it could give someone that extra hope or that idea absolutely and that's what you, you're putting that and that's why you probably are having such right. an easy time selling films getting yeah. capital for films getting good actors and actresses yeah because you're so dialed in just looking at your eyes uh -huh. you're Thanks. straight ready to go I'm like ready you're, to go. you're like we got we got we lives got we got the world to change yeah we do i mean if i could only do those kind of films i would Unfortunately, I've also got to pay for this office and make money, so we will do X amount of action movies and sci-fi, but my passion, I want to make the di a difference. I, you know, I really, whether it's one film or two films or 10 films, you know, I just want to give back. I think if everybody, going back to life, if everybody would live their life as if they were leaving a footprint um, for somebody else to follow down the line, we'd all live much better lives and i i definitely want to leave a footprint i want i want to touch someone's life um when my last breath is gone and just be remembered and not by who you dated or who you married or some silly thing that you did in life whose life did you change so again going back to traveling and turning this full circle around if you're lucky enough to be able to travel i don't care if you're traveling to palmdale you know wherever it is that you're traveling stop and make a difference to somebody take an article of clothing that you're not going to wear anymore and give it to somebody else um i changed all my mattresses in my house this year it's silly um but i didn't throw them out i didn't leave them on the side of the street i took them to downtown la went to 10 city and handed them to some people and i remember 
the man that I was with at the time was like, why are we doing this? And why not? Why not? Why not? That mattress, I remember we gave one of the big mattresses to a family and they were so thankful, so thankful. It was a mattress and a blanket. But to them, that was everything. Why not? And so I, I try to live my life every day like that. If I can just change one person's life, one person's life, or do something nice once a day, it might be a smile, it might be a hug. Just do anything, anything. And I can't convey that enough. That's what I want to convey to the youth today. Get off your phones, put it down. You're not changing anybody's life on a phone. You're not changing anybody's life by a Snapchat or a photo. You're just not. You might think you are. You might put your words of wisdom. You know, um, you might leave. Here's another silly story, but to me it wasn't. Um, I saw online an actor friend of mine, and he was posting something very dark. Um, he was just going through a, tar- a dark time. He was on a film set. He's constantly working. But we all go through dark. And he had posted to his fans a video about how dark it was getting. And so I picked up the phone and I called him. I hadn't spoken to him in a year. We're not working together. I just said, I want to know if you're okay. And he was speechless. And he goes, oh, my God, why are you calling me? And I said, well, I saw that you posted this. And he said, oh, thank you so much. You know, I was just going through a lonely time on a set. Sets are lonely. By the way, everybody out there, they can get very lonely when you're in the middle of nowhere. And um, he was so taken back that I called him. And I said to him, I'm not one of those people that are going to write praying for you. You know, I might write that anyways, but what does that mean? Pick up the phone. We're losing the ability to connect with people. And people think that by saying praying for you or thinking about you or whatever, that that's all they need to do. And then they're on to the next thing and they're not even thinking about it. What about just picking up the phone and saying that? Pick up the phone and saying that, that's a whole nother thing. A gift of your time. Gift of your time. But people aren't doing that anymore. And my worry is the next generation um, that can't get off their phones, that think that writing, um, answering a Facebook or or an Instagram or a Snapchat or whatever it is, is all they need to do. That swiping right or left to date or to get a partner. No. no so no. addicting. Dating so apps addicting. are so addicting. I've never been on one, but I hear that they're addicting. I mean, I look at my friends and I'm like swiping for them. And I'm like, oh my God, you guys. But what are we doing? We're picking out the prettiest orange in the fruit bowl. You know, that's what we're doing, really? Yeah, I, I mean, I get it. I've never done it, but I find it fascinating. The gifting process. It's when something's gifted to you, it has so much value. So much value. You could buy something on Amazon right now for 50 bucks. It shows up at your house. You really don't care at all. But then someone gives you something for six to ten bucks and it's a gift. Yep. Changes everything. everything. It has a story. I'm sure everything here has everything. a story. When Every I look in your office, thing. that globe probably has a story. These were all so that globe was given to me by an actor named Misai Morales at the time. I think that globe came to me right after September 11th. And it does have a story. Everything has a story. And at the time, I'm very political. We won't go into that. But, um, you know, the world had changed. And there it is. So everything has a story. The thing next to it came to me from an intern who went to Brazil. You know, this protection tree came to me from a girlfriend in Vegas who started working for something. This came, we're shooting a movie in India. So I got Ganesh from somebody prepping us, you know, for what's coming. Um, The picture, you can't see, but there's a picture frame of something. And that came from... Um, an Israeli friend of mine, and that's protection as well. So everything has a story. Um, Behind you is one of my favorite things that came for a birthday of mine, and it's a picture of the Beatles um, laying down with Muhammad Ali above them, and it's signed. It's an original signed piece and very famous piece, and everybody who knows me well knows that um, music is everything. Music can change a bad day into a good day if you just let yourself, you know, go into the beats of it. Um, so yeah, everything in my house too and everything I have is has a story. You mentioned about doing. We recently interviewed someone named The Plastic Free Mermaid. Her name's Kate Nelson. Wow. And this girl for the last 10 years has lived a plastic free lifestyle. It's amazing. In every attribute besides protective sex that's what she mentioned she's like that's the only plastic she'll ever use okay but she never uses any plastic and it's interesting because when you come into contact with her you get so inspired because she's doing it she's not obviously she's talking about on social media but she's out there living doing it if everyone lives plastic free we'd be in a lot different situation right 
just the people that are doing doing is what makes it things encourages and inspires you're the definition of that type of person yeah and i want to be that's such a good thing to stand for yeah and you also co-founded the omnicultural film festival yeah tv festival so we're going into our second year um it's amazing um diversity is very important in hollywood and should be around the world um so the omnicultural tv festival is a television festival celebrating diversity And what we figured out was that there was a hole. There's very big television festivals, NAPD being one of the biggest, where um, creators of huge shows go to that festival and they present it to all of the marketing and advertisers. So that's how you get the the big brand sponsors. What we also realized is that there's a lot of film festivals out there tons of film festivals you have a short you have a brand new movie you can take it to festivals i've never even heard of everybody and their brothers popping up one and hopefully you'll get discovered and you'll be able to go to one of the biggest ones like sundance or or toronto or Cannes, the holy grail um but television didn't have that and so we found a hole where filmmakers um, from all over the world can present it to some of the biggest um, we've now partnered with Amazon. We've partnered with Women in Film. We've partnered with NAPD itself, which is the biggest in TV. And we're giving an opportunity for newcomers in television because television is such a powerful medium now to submit their projects to us and get it in front of some of the biggest, be it actors, directors, platforms itself, again, like Amazon or Netflix, um, and take it to the next level. And the amazing thing for us is to have the holy grail of NAPTI itself um, partner with us. That's crazy. It's amazing. And amazing that it happened in the first year. In the first year. In the first year. That that doesn't happen. So a girlfriend of mine, Kiki Melendez, so props to Kiki, um, thought of this, um, bought me in and asked if I would co-found it with her, and we're really proud of it. Damn. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. What's one of the, the um, in terms of TV, is there yeah. anything that you can mention that you're working on right now that we can talk about? Well, Ellis is the first one. Ellis, Ellis Island, okay. yeah. So that's the first one. We have two more following it that I can't talk about yet. Um, one that we're hoping to sell to MGM Studios next. And um, we're also going to get into reality, and I can't talk about that either. We're actually going into contracts for it, but a very classy reality show in the vein of Anthony Bourdain, but doesn't have to do with food. Gotcha. Shout out, Anthony. Shout out, Anthony. Legend. Legend. Lived the lifestyle we're talking about. 100%. So if you mentioned one thing, you mentioned if I could go back in time, I would have told myself to just do it more. Yeah, you said something about that. But if you could go back in time, we're going to bring this one more time, pre-college, and you could have whispered to yourself, you know, maybe one, two or three things, who you are right now Mm -hmm. and say 16, 17 year old you. What would you have told yourself that would have saved you a ton of time, money, heartache, tears? And it can't be I wouldn't change anything. Hmm. So let me correct a second um, what what you said. Strangely, I wouldn't go back in time and tell my younger self, just do it, because my younger self did just do it. I was saying my younger self needs to whisper to my older self to just do it. So a lot of people are so stuck in the past of what they would change. I have to get my past to remind my future to catch up with itself. And that's an interesting thing to think about. The only thing I would tell my younger self is to enjoy it more. Um, I was so caught up in doing it that I forgot to take the deep inhale and say, I did it. And so um, I think, you know, I was very caught up in, okay, we did one move, what's the next? Instead of stopping and saying, I did it, I did it. I didn't get help from anybody. I did it, and it was amazing. And so what I would say to anybody's younger self is we start to think, especially if we become successful, that it's just going to be handed to us. At one day, it, one day it's not. To all of us, I don't care how big you are, there is going to be at one time in your life that it's going to start ebbing, and it's not. And hopefully at that moment you were lucky enough to have enjoyed the process along the way. Um, so that you can look back without regrets, look back and smile and enjoy it and say, that was me. And I did that. Yeah. And be happy about your peaks and your valleys. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing I might say though, to my younger self is, um, I was so 
busy and worried about becoming successful and doing something that I was told I couldn't do. Um, so you're kind of proving something. Yeah, everybody from my family to my friends at the time to people I had met along the way, everybody wants to tell you what you can't do. You can't be a producer. You haven't raised a bunch of money. You can't be a producer. You didn't go to film school. You can't start a company. You don't know what you're doing. And so I had a lot of, I'm going to prove to you wrong. And, and I did, and I proved them wrong and proved myself right, and that was all great. The only thing that I would say to everybody, and it's how I'm living my life with this new company, is find the balance. My relationship at the time suffered, and I don't regret it. It needed to be done at the time, but he was second. And in the going forward phase, there won't be a second. There's a balance to my life. When weekends come, I'm going to enjoy it. And, you know, when I'm not working, I'm not going to talk about film then. I, you know, I'm very balanced. I'm into news. I'm into travel. I'm into music. I'm into all different things. I think the other thing that I would caution people is whatever you're good at, I don't care if you're a comic book illustrator or a movie producer or, you know, or a singer, get out of your own box and experience the rest of life. It doesn't mean you're not still great at it. It doesn't mean you're not passionate about what you're doing. But make sure that you know that life goes on around you in different ways and be curious about what they're doing too. It's really important to have that curiosity because I, I find a lot of people get caught in their box and they only want to talk about that box, um, which is strange to me. I want to talk about everything. There's nothing. You want to talk about bugs? I can talk about bugs Let's for the next two out. hours, a right? A bug's life, a Let's great film out, right? back in the day. It's like, just be curious about life. That's actually what prompted this podcast because you know okay. and a lot of people want to be online marketers that's me i yeah. want to one day you know target a niche and crush it but i'm into too many things yeah me too. i can't like focus on one thing whether it be direct sales whether it be nutrition whether it be um scuba like i'm love fish i'm a huge yeah, with, like, yeah. fish tanks and cleaning oh, that's great you know like there's so many different things i'm excited about yeah, so this too. is the best way to explore so many different Good for contents you. you know what i'm saying and you love what you do so much fun i mean great? i'm st- so you're coming to one of my dinners. I, make, I love it. I'm we ready. We made the most unbelievable chicken parm last time. There we go. We my do, favorite too. We go vegan also as well. I'm, so whatever I'm you play. I'm vegan, so I'll eat the chicken parm. It's good. <laughs> All right, perfect. Yeah. But it's just good vibes and good people and just you never know what those connections can bring. And just having a meaningful conversation is something. Isn't that great? You know, it's good I, for you. Even the first 20 episodes we used to have our phone, I, I say, Scott, you got to take my phone. Get it away. Yeah. You know, we gotta I gotta look you in the ass. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. I know you. the listeners have really gotten a ton of value from you. You're open, you're real. Yeah. You're a good person. Thank you. You're a dime. That's all I want to be known as. Good. And that's really cool. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for bringing us into your yeah. beautiful, beautiful thank spot. Thank you. And thank it, you for reaching out to me. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, super accessible. So I love meeting people and hearing people and meeting people like you and you know anybody who wants me dm me i'm always willing to answer what's your instagram cindy cowan 1000 is my instagram and um yes that is me answering people are shocked and they're like it can't be you answering all those it is me um i i think it's inauthentic to have somebody else do it for you so Authenticity. That's, that's what we're Thank trying to do. Thank you for listening for. to another episode of Len Jones Looking in the mirror and loving that person. Absolutely. If you enjoyed it, right. please With leave that us a said, thank you so much for being on. Thank you. Thank you. On our new thank, you. thank you for having me. And remember, hope is not a strategy. Keep making moves. Till next time, peace.